You're listening to Bible Prophecy Daily, a weekday podcast where Bible prophecy matters and matters greatly. Hello and welcome back. Thank you for joining us. My name is Charles Cooper, and we are continuing a study that I have entitled Eschatological Geography, the world map at the beginning of Daniel's 70th week. It is my conviction that the world map, that is the shape of it, is the is the greatest indicator of where human history is in connection with eschatological fulfillment than any other predictor. I believe that unless the world map is shaped in a certain way with certain nations in in their designated locations with the people so named by it, if these are not in place, then the end time sequence is not going to begin. Daniel's final week will not begin until all the pieces of the puzzle are in place geographically. And the geography, the world map as it exists at this moment, is not sufficient to warrant speculations about the return of Jesus Christ. It is just that simple. I believe that there are 10 nations which are specifically named in Scripture as significant in terms of their place in the end time sequence. Now, one of the uh, issues that we will have to wrestle with is whether the land itself must bear the name or simply be recognized as the geographical location that the Bible speaks of. Now, when it comes to the nation of Israel, we believe that the nation of Israel named Israel with the Jewish people in place with a national leader who can and will make decisions about his people was absolutely necessary in order for this end time sequence to begin. It has always been thus, and when Israel was not in the land, and when they were not a national people, and they didn't have a national leader in a geographical location, there simply was no need for anyone to be upset or frightened or thinking that the end time sequence was going to begin, because it was not. The second group of people that we need to talk about, which we began in our last time, is the Assyrian people. The Assyrian people will need a regathering, a restoration to their land, just as Israel has been restored to it. We primarily begin this understanding based on Isaiah chapter 19, verse 23 through 25. In that day, there will be a highway from Egypt to Assyria, and Assyria will come into Egypt, and Egypt into Assyria, and the Egyptian will worship with the Assyrians. In that day, Israel will be the third with Egypt and Assyria, a blessing in the midst of the earth, whom the Lord of hosts has blessed, saying, Blessed be Egypt, my people, and Assyria, the work of my hands, and Israel, my inheritance. Now, this is a very, very significant prophecy that God is duty-bound to fulfill. Now, the obvious question is whether or not the fulfillment will occur before the 70th week began, during the 70th week, or after the 70th week. In other words, will God restore the uh, Assyrians to their land and then bless them as he has promised 
after the conflagration of the 70th week and the putting down of Satan and his Antichrist? Or will there be a geographical footprint for named Assyria on a world map with the peoples designated as Assyrians before the 70th week itself begins? I believe that they must be there in place before the 70th week began because of other prophetic teachings that God has that we will look at regarding the Assyrian people. Now, in Isaiah chapter 19, beginning at verse 23, it says, in that day. Now, that phrase, in that day, is a technical phrase that applies to the end times uh, in connection with Daniel's 70th week. It is used consistently throughout the Old Testament to speak of that time when God comes into human history and physically manifests and begins to uh, unravel the evil of this world and remove it and setting up a kingdom that we now know will be ruled by the God-man, Jesus Christ, on this earth for a thousand years. It says, in that day, there will be this highway. So, this clearly indicates that during the millennial kingdom and during the time when God is physically manifested on this earth, we will see the fulfillment of this Assyrian prophecy. Now, the question is, must it be in place before the seventh week began, or can it occur afterwards, seeing the ultimate fulfillment in connection with the millennial kingdom of the rule of God? The fact that there is no geographical designation on the world map at this time of Assyria or its people uh, should give pause and should lead us to uh, study more in order to make sure we understand exactly what it is that this text is saying. The national restoration of the Assyrian people must be assumed here, just as Israel was returned to its land, just as there has been the national restoration of Israel, we believe there's also going to be a national restoration of the Assyrian people. Now, the Assyrian homeland, the, the land that should rightly be designated as Syria, is today covered or is a region that is currently divided between modern-day Iraq, southeast Turkey, northwest Iran, and northeastern Syria. So the land that is rightfully the homeland of the Assyrian people are at this point, at this time, taken up by Iraq, Turkey, Iran, and Syria. They have co-opted, robbed, and persecuted the Assyrian people for generations. They have decimated them and killed them and mistreated the peoples who are rightly called Assyrians. Now, you need to know that the Assyrian people speak Aramaic. Of course, many know that that is the language of the Lord Jesus, that Aramaic was spoken throughout the land of Israel during the time our Lord was here on earth. Most people don't know that the Assyrians are almost exclusively Christians, uh, Catholics, many of them uh, in the Catholic Church, and that the Assyrian people were one of the first peoples to fully adopt Christianity as 
of faith. They go back to years, decades, uh, close to the beginning of the Christian faith in the land of Israel. I have met and spent time in the presence of Assyrian people. They are wonderful people. And there are Assyrians here in America where I first met and got to know uh, the Assyrians and their hopes and dreams of once, hopefully, returning to their original land. The city of Nineveh, the ancient city of Nineveh, which of course is the focus of uh, the book of Jonah, that ancient city today is the city of Mosul. Now, you, you probably heard a lot about the city of Mosul during the, the Iraq war and during the uh, necessity of the Americans putting down the so-called caliphate that was attempting to establish a nation or rule in the Middle East right in the center of what is historically uh, ancient known as Assyria. Nineveh, which was the oldest and largest city of the ancient Assyrian Empire, uh, drew the attention of God uh, and received one of, the, one of two nations to receive a prophet who brought the word of God in order for those peoples uh, to repent. So the, the, the Assyrian people have a huge influence on Old Testament in terms of their involvement and God's utilization of the people, the Assyrians, for his kingdom and for his work. My point that I want you to understand is that the Assyrian people were a special people to God, going all the way back to Genesis chapter 10, 11, and 12 in the uh, chronology of the nations as the genealogies are highlighted from Ham came Cush, whom we would see as Ethiopian peoples, and from the Ethiopian peoples came Nimrod, who is the father of the ancient city of Nineveh and the Assyrian people. These are special people to God whom God has had a relationship with for centuries, it has not been highly detailed in Scripture. We don't know a lot about it. God didn't give us a lot of information, but that doesn't mean that they were not significant. And of course, God used the Assyrians as the instrument of punishment for the ten northern tribes whom the Assyrians took out of the land and scattered across the Middle East. Many of them remained in uh, Assyria intermarried with the Assyrian people and are thus part of Abraham's great blessing. You need to understand, ladies and gentlemen, that God has a special place uh, in his heart for the Assyrian people, which of course is evidenced in Isaiah chapter 19 and the prophecy regarding what God is going to do. Now, of some interest is the book of Jonah. Jonah chapter 1, verse 1 and 2 says, Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it, for their evil has come up before me. Now, of course, all the nations at this point were evil. Um, why is it that Nineveh gets the special treatment by God uh, and the call of a prophet in order to delay or to remove the threat of God's judgment against these people. Well, Jonah chapter 3, after Jonah has been swallowed by the whale and has gone through all of that, 
Uh, finally, it says in Jonah chapter 3, Jonah began to go into the city going a day's journey, and he called out, Yet forty days in Nineveh shall be overthrown. And the people of Nineveh believed God. The people of Nineveh believed God. Now, the first time we read of someone who believed a promise of God was Abraham. God made a promise to Abraham in Genesis chapter uh, 14, 15, 16, highlight the significance of that. And in 15, it tells us that Abraham believed the promise of God and God credited it to Abraham as righteousness. In other words, if you believe the promise of God, God will accord you righteous. It says they call for a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest of them to the least of them in order to prove and evidence the true change of heart regarding their evil and their hope that God would spare them from their destruction. The word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it if, if the message I tell you. So Jonah rose, went to Nineveh, according to the word of the Lord, now, Nineveh was an exceedingly great city, three days' journey in breadth. So it was a very large city. It was a metropolitan area, significant in every way. And yet God had a very special love, a very special intent for the city of Nineveh and the Assyrian people who lived there. Interestingly, Jonah, Jonah chapter 3, verse 9 through 10 says, who knows? This is the king speaking after he heard Jonah's uh, prophecy. Who knows? God may turn and relent and turn from his fierce anger so that we may not perish. When God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil way, God relented of the disaster that he had said he would do to them, and he did not do it. The Assyrian people received the grace because of their repentance and their belief in the promise of God. And as a result, God showed great mercy to these people, of course, which Jonah simply hated, didn't like, and was upset about. The important point that I want to emphasize here is that the Assyrian people have had a very significant role in the history of the world, particularly as it relates to God and his work with Israel. And as a result of it, God has called them his special work, the work of his hands. In fact, in Isaiah chapter 19, verse 25, this text says, Blessed be Egypt, my people, Assyria, the work of my hands, and Israel, my inheritance. These are the three unique designations that God uses for three different people groups who will be the avenue and funnel through which the blessings of God will flow to all those on the earth during the millennial kingdom of God. Isaiah chapter 19, verse 25 says, Blessed be Assyria, the work of my hands. Now, the phrase, the work of my hands, is also used for the nation of Israel. And notice, notice it says in Isaiah chapter 29, verse 22 to 24, Therefore thus says the Lord, who redeemed Abraham, Concerning the house of Jacob, Jacob shall no more be ashamed, no more shall his face grow pale. For when he sees his children, the work of my hands. Here the exact same phrase is used to describe the children of Jacob that God worked with, blessed, brought, and put in a unique and special relationship. For when he sees his children, Jacob, that is, the work of my hands in the midst, 
They will sanctify my name. They will sanctify the Holy One of Jacob and will stand in awe of the God of Israel. And those who go astray in spirit will come to understand and those who murmur will accept instruction. Here, the restoration of Israel and the blessings that God will give them is said to be the work of my hands. So this phrase, work of my hands, indicates a special relationship that God has with that which he himself produces, that they are the work of God's hand, not man, not of the world, but in fact is a supernatural development that only God could accomplish. Also in Isaiah chapter 60, verse 21, it says, Your people shall all be righteous. They shall possess the land forever, the branch of my planting, the work of my hands, that I might be glorified. Here again is God's description of his work with the children of Israel and the fact that when they are returned, when the restoration is complete and the nation has been restored to the land, the people will then be accorded the designation, the work of my hands. In other words, the accomplishment by God, the supernatural work of God, can only be ascribed to God Almighty and to no, no one else. This tells me that the restoration of Assyria is a supernatural work of God that no one will be able to credit or take credit for the restoration except God. It will be so evident and so monumental in its impact and its import that the world will see and recognize that Assyria is, in fact, the very work of God's hand. He made it. He built it. He developed it. He put it together. Now, the question that we need to ask uh, An answer is whether or not the Assyrian people who have been promised by God to be one of the three most powerful representatives of God's blessings on earth during the millennial kingdom, whether or not they must be in place before the 70th week begins. This is the question that we have to answer because if it it's true that they must be in place, then they, like Israel, is a major indicator of where we are in the chronology of moving into the end time sequence. That sequence cannot start until national Israel and national Assyrian, Assyria is in place in their geographical location, their historical geographical location, by which they were known at the time the prophecy was given and will be known at the time of the prophetic fulfillment. Now, the next time we're going to look at the question, must Assyria be in place before the 70th week actually begins? Thanks for listening to Bible Prophecy Daily. We hope you learned something valuable today. Be sure to subscribe wherever you heard this podcast so you never miss an episode.